right, it's another episode of Guitar Wankers, the show where Barry Gilman and Asher Black enjoy wanking and with various instruments. And, uh, and so welcome. If you're a regular listener, you probably know about GuitarRealm.com, where you can go and join a community of other guitarists who also like to wank and also are studying to improve their skill and become master guitarists. Some of them, like myself, take direct one-on-one -on -one lessons with uh, Barry, which has been really transformative for my life, so I encourage you to visit GuitarRealm.com. Uh, that's me kicking the strings of my guitar, you know? I like occasionally just kicking it because it sounds as good as when I play it, but... <laughs> yeah, I thought it was me. But it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I saw you look, yeah. I was like, he's looking was, for the knob. What did he touch? It's like, no, it's my foot. Yeah, yeah there's a guitar down here. <laughs> there's a guitar behind me. There's a bunch of guitars over there. So uh, we're yeah. here today to talk about um, chasing the perfect tone. And uh, this is not a show on how to find, this episode is not an episode on how to find your perfect tone or how to chase the perfect tone. Uh, so I'll, I'll kick it off, Barry, and, and say, um, yeah. you know, I, I see a lot of guys like in Reddit and other forums and stuff like that, mm -hmm. uh, buying uh, tone devices, you know, constantly shopping for pedals, hundreds of pedals, trading them in, buying new ones. They'll, they'll spend like a year just on echoes uh, or on reverbs mm -hmm. and they'll, they'll buy and sell reverb pedals chasing the perfect reverb pedal uh, and they'll uh, buy and sell, they'll, they'll aim like, how do I reproduce the Gilmore tone? And they're, they're mm -hmm. aiming to produce that and they can't seem to pull it off and make it sound exactly 100% like the album. Um, and I've spent a little bit of time, <clears throat> you know, nursing my tone as well. I think people mm -hmm. do that. I spent time yeah. picking out my cabinet, uh, which I'm happy with, and I spent time picking out my amps, and uh, I spent uh, more time than I'd like to admit on the pedals. Uh, but I'm kind of happy and, and done now. You know, I might occasionally pick up a, you know, a noise pedal, a noise gate or something like that, but for the most part, I, I didn't dedicate my life to it in the way that some people spend seven hours a night playing Call of Duty. And mm. uh, for me, you know, I see some flaws in the chasing of the perfect tone, not the least of which is you could spend a lot more time trying to uh, reproduce a certain sound than you spend on actually getting better as a guitarist. And a great guitarist like Slash can be on the road, walk into a guitar center, p pick up like a, a, a shitty $300 Squire guitar and make that thing mm. sound awesome, good enough to go on stage with it the next night, you know, because there's some mm. reason why his favorite guitar is not going to be there in time or whatever. And you and I could sit there and spend 10 times that amount and 10 times that amount of time locating equipment and not sound like a pimple on Slash's guitar. And, uh, yeah. and it's largely, it's the person that plays, not the equipment. Uh, so that's a, a big part of it for me. Hmm. Well, me too. I mean, uh, I, I, <clears throat> when I was growing up, I was always, I always, the words that were flying around my mind around my circles was, uh, the tone is in the fingers. Mm. Uh, when I, 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 I did kind of get that, you know, because I, I resonated with that a lot. Uh, I played a lot of guitar without an amp, you know, just an unplugged electric guitar, mainly because, well, it was just easier. Just pick up the guitar and just go for it, you know, um, on those fly by moments of just a bit of laziness to plug it in. But you know, the, the overall smoothness <coughs> and the techniques and everything can totally be brought out with an unplugged electric guitar. And for me, you know, if I, if you had to record that unplugged electric guitar with no noise, you know, room in the noise and um, noise in the room, sorry, uh, you'd, you'd get a good, uh, uh, you'd get a, something that sounds like a guitar. It'll sound cool. And if you're playing it well, it would sound pretty cool. Mm. Uh, but I guess, you know, so what's the point of all this equipment then, you know, to, uh, because you, this, this certain sounds you just can't get with an unplugged guitar, right? Well, you I know, mean, you want to sculpt your, amp for sure. you want to sculpt your sound to a certain degree. It's a normal impulse, you know, but the problem is, you know, we do a lot of this at the beginning and sculpting, a, a sculpting a crappy sound. You know, sculpt, sculpting mediocre guitar playing and trying to get it all out of the tone uh, and being able to, you know, a machine can generate a decent tone, uh, but 
we play guitar because we're human beings. And so I, I think sometimes we, uh, we miss this, the fundamental human element and try to replace it with equipment because it seems like a shortcut. Um, so it's really the shortcut thing I'm kind of pushing out back against that there are no shortcuts mm -hmm. to this. You've got to suck for years and be really crappy and have the balls to be really crappy. You have to have the courage to wank in order to, mm -hmm. you know, get awesome. But yeah. that kind of brings up the second thing, which is, you know, trying to copy the Gilmore tone or the Clapton tone or the, uh, the Hendrix tone. You know, it's fraught with all kinds of problems because which, which Gilmore tone, which album, which Hendrix tone, you know, like wh which exact, which performance? Because he's swapping equipment out all the time and trying different things and experimenting. But he's also mostly working on his own playing and he's composing and improvising. And, and the balance is, is quite a bit different. Uh, but on top of that, you know, I mean, unless you're going to buy the same rack equipment, you know, and and have a have roadies and a soundboard guy and, you know, a bunch of technicians and stuff like that. You're not really going to you see it on Reddit. Well, I nailed this tone. I'm like, did you nail the tone? Because I bet I bet if we printed that on vinyl, <laughs> it mm. would not sound it might sound good. But it, uh, and it and it also brings up perfect tone. Perfect, like we're yeah. chasing perfect tone, you know. It's it's you know you, you, the moment you said, if I had to hear that on vinyl, that instantly for me tells me, well, if you had to hear it in a in a beautifully laid out analog studio, you know, where 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 all the amps were um, analog equipment, pedals, old school style, the masters of wiring, pedals are are in the equation, you know. Um, all that real <clears throat> good, hot, you know, what, uh, what was that you were saying the other day, uh, red hot tubes or something, <laughs> the tubes, the, the sound of the tubes, the, the, the tone, everything, everything is, um, all these little tiny details that, that this equipment can, can give you, uh, the, the, the word perfect and perfect tone chasing. I mean, there's so many elements in there in the recording studio. Well, a lot of uh, it is added in post-production anyway, you know, like the, it's kind of specious to try to search for, um, in some ways, the perfect fuzz reverb, all of that, because you take a song like maggot brain by funkadelic and Eddie Hazel played that song clean. All of that, all of those effects were added, uh, in the studio. Uh, before it, by a technician before it hit vinyl, which is actually the best practice. So the idea of generating that in the room, you might feel like you're nailing the tone, but you're not. But it kind of it kind of brings up this other thing, which is what constitutes the perfect tone or a good tone. And in the end, you you see guys like Eddie Hazel going, "I'm not satisfied," or Hendrix even going, "I'm not satisfied with." with that and they keep working at it so just because mm -hmm. they put out an album doesn't mean they thought it was a perfect tone but why why in hell do are we trying to be some other person so i don't want another man's uh name on my shirt and my guitar and my my amp and my if you're going to do that and you make a record just put his name on the record too like in the end why are we out there trying to become clapton or david gilmore or Jimi hendrix i'd rather be myself and sound like me you know, <laughs> mm. I think the cool thing is that <clears throat> when you're when you're chasing the perfect tone <coughs> and you're trying to get to sound like your your um, your mentors or the guys you you, you look up to, you know, um, you, you won't get their tone. I, I just can't see how you'd get their tone exactly. There's just too many elements in the studio, you know, that you didn't see like that post production type of thing. But You'll you'll get close to a good, a damn good tone if you try. A good approximation. Like these guys have done in the studio, so just yeah, uh, you know, chasing the perfect tone, I think, is like essentially super super important. But um, yeah, not really um, to get the perfect tone. Just like your, if you say Slash's tone is the perfect tone, are you going to get the perfect tone? Well, without his budget, probably unlikely. Well, that's the you thing know. is, first, yeah. you've got, you've got, look, each of these guys have a signature tone. So what's the point yeah. of us as individual artists? And if we pick up the guitar, is it a hobby or is it art? What are we, what are we trying to do? Is it a job? Mm. And, 
you know, somebody else always tries to make that decision for you. You know, I've had people look at me and go, oh, you know, it's uh, good to have a hobby. And I'm like, screw you. This is not a hobby. This is my art. And they're like, oh, well, do you get paid for it? And I'm like, no, that would make it a job. But thanks for your input, you know, like, and, and it's okay to, for, for you to be confused. But for me, what I, what I notice about Gilmore and, and Hendrix and these guys is uh, almost invariably they developed their own signature tone, their own way of playing there. And they chose sound sculpting instruments uh, that were designed to facilitate that, what they had what they, they experimented and decided what they liked and made it a little more this or that. And that's really the lesson. As learners, as students, as artists, you don't want a painter that just copies Jackson Pollock, you know, and goes, well, you know, I'm, I'm painting in the Jackson Pollock style and how can I get my stuff to look exactly like a Jackson Pollock? Because now you're not a painter, you're a forger. And that's, that's a bit different, right? So why are we trying mm. to forge all of these guys' music. What? To impress our friends? I see people in Guitar Center. I hate Guitar Center, by the way. But I, you go in there to, to look at something or because you need a cable. And there's all these guys that come in when they get out of school or get off work. And they sit down and they play uh, the opening to Sweet Child of Mine for, you know, 20 minutes. And then they leave. Mm -hmm. Over and over again. You know, deedle, 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 deedle. And it's like, okay, cool. And they're friends. That, they bring friends with them and they sit around and watch them. And they're like, and they're like, ooh, that's so cool. And I'm like, is it though? Is it really that cool to sit there and go, I can play that song too, and I can make it sound as close to Axel, to, to Slash as possible, and I can, if I want, I can sing the Axel Rose part. I, I like so. So what about take like Cheryl Crow? She she covered "Sweet Child of Mine." There's nothing wrong with covers, but she put her own spin on it. She did an acoustic uh, version of it. That's yeah, awesome. You know, when Johnny Cash mm. or Bob Dylan. Uh, covered a song, they did their own thing with it and didn't try to mm -hmm. just copy the original source. You know, if he's taking it from, from, uh, yeah. 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 No, if he's no, taking it from Howlin' that. Wolf. He's not trying to, mm -hmm. I've seen guys busking out on the, like the public square that are cultivating a Dylan voice and trying to play note for note a Bob Dylan song and sound exactly like Bob Dylan. And they've mm -hmm. spent an incredible amount of money on a particular guitar. They're like, this is, Bob Dylan's guitar and I'm like which one he had in his lifetime <laughs> you know and yeah. so so which you know so they've managed to capture a moment in time and duplicate it but is that really satisfying and the point mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to make is just in respect to what you said about budget an incredible amount of money would have to be spent as well as time uh, to try to mm -hmm. create any one of these uh, perfect mm -hmm. tones and mm -hmm. it, whether you nail it or not uh, could that time, effort, and cash be better spent on developing your own sound and loving it and loving your life for it. Mm. Yeah. Look, if you're in a tribute band and you're trying to get the, you know, then I, uh, totally I, I can understand, you mm -hmm. know, that makes total sense. Um, I'm a little guilty of playing covers, uh, you know, uh, to the T and trying to sound like someone mm. like I, I spent, <laughs> ah, man, I, 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 you know, trying to sound like someone singing, trying to sound, I mean, this is a bit of, this is not guitaring related, but from singing, you know, just singing for fun, mm. um, trying to sound like somebody, mm. it's generally not going to go well. Oh, you I, know? I do it in the I, shower. <laughs> I will sing Johnny Cash to sound like we, Johnny Cash and Elvis to yeah, sound yeah. like Elvis. Because I'm digging it, and I'm, but I'm and I'm just playing around. But the idea yeah. that I would dedicate my life, and sure, if I was in, I wouldn't be interested in being in a Frank Sinatra, yeah. you know, uh, tribute band and trying to sound like, you know, uh, the the yeah. chairman of the board. But I, but I, I like I dig. I, I'll sing a song like Frank Sinatra. I'll sing a song like uh, Joe Piscopo imitating Frank Sinatra on Saturday Night Live. You know, doing doing the theme to the Flintstones because I think that's fun as hell. But the right. idea that you dedicate your life wearing another guy's clothes, uh, it, it gets beyond equipment obsession, yeah, then, yeah. you know, and it becomes yeah, yeah, obsession yeah. with imitation. And imita mm. if you're obsessed with imitation, you'll always be an imitator. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, uh, but throughout the years, just going back to me trying to sound like the guy exactly, um, there is way more value out there. I've picked up throughout the years in taking something like Cheryl Crow did and making it your own. People respect it way more. Mm. I think the audience is more, it's more captivated. 
if they hear it and it sounds like too much you just I've, I've heard this flying around you know oh man i'd rather just you know put on the original song and listen to the original song that's the original song that's you know why why can't i just do that why do i have to listen to you i'm out of here you know <laughs> Well, it's kind of like when you go to a concert well, uh, this, uh, and everybody to to sings the version? song, you know, <laughs> yeah. right at the good part, you go to an yeah. Aerosmith concert or something and they know, they're playing to the crowd because they bought their tickets and I'm there to hear Aerosmith, but no, you know, uh, Tyler sticks the microphone out and the whole crowd sings the song and now we got 20 minutes of the crowd trying to, to be Aerosmith and I'm like, okay, and we were like, that was so great. Well, it is if you went to hear yourself, but if you went to hear Aerosmith, <laughs> you're kind of pissed off, you know, and if yes. they do that, some bands will do that. You'll get the Scorpions uh, and they'll do that three or four songs in a row. And I, I love the Scorpions, yeah. but I'm there to hear the Scorpions. So I'd rather just, yeah, like what you said, I'd rather listen to the record, yeah. <laughs> than, yeah. you know, than listen to the audience. <clears throat> Well, well uh, I think it's kind of justifies everything, you know, I, well, I'm not really justifies. It's, just a, it's a nice kind of summary as to like chasing the perfect tone. Um, when looking back on it, it's, um, it's all about, you know, it's almost like a quality of being true to who you are, you know, go for your uh, be do what you do what you think sounds cool. If it's I, I recorded I, well, it's probably gonna and it's mastered properly and mixed well. And it's a bit of post production, whatever your tone is, can kind of probably work eventually you know well, this is why i'm not a big fan of remixes at all it's i'm not part of that whole dj remix culture thing i'm not knocking it if that's what you are it just doesn't interest me but meaning not you but you in the audience mm. but that said it takes more creativity to remix uh, a, a version of a song that in the end when you're done with it somebody would like to listen to than it does to perfectly imitate you know, uh, Stairway to Heaven or perfectly imitate, you know, Wish You Were Here or something, something like that. Uh, all that requires is buying, spending a lot of money on equipment and playing the same song over and over again until it sounds like the record. It's basically duplication. But if I could have gone down to the store and bought that record for $20, and I've duplicated it too, man. So what do I need you for? You know, like in the end, I would rather, I, I, I have a song and I don't want to say it on the air which one it is because I want it to mm. be my thing. But mm. uh, there's a song where I love what the singer's doing and I absolutely mm. hate the music that's with it. And so I'm mm. torn when I listen to this song. It's just an mm. apocalyptic nightmare of music. But the, mm. the vocalist is, uh, is abysmally wonderful. And so I'm determined to set and to compose different music, not like a duplication of the same song, but played in a different tone or a different key, not transpose, different music to that particular uh, vocalist lyrics and cook my own thing. And uh, I think that would be a fun exercise. Why not take a song like Sweet Child of Mine? And uh, I, I heard Willie Nelson sing Amazing Grace, a song that I loathe. No offense mm -hmm. if it's it's not an agenda or an ideology for which I loathe mm -hmm. it. I just I loathe it. It's to me it's such a cliche and it's it's a boring song and I really don't like mm -hmm. it. And anytime somebody whips it out, I'm like, not this again. Just sing tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree while you're at it. You know, like uh, Tony mm -hmm. Orlando and Dawn. Uh, for the for you older uh, wankers, mm -hmm. you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. For you younger wankers. <laughs> that are confused, look at the nearest older wanker and he's nodding along going, yeah, I remember that show. Anyway, hee-haw. But anyway, the, the, the point is, you take, you take Willie Nelson, he takes Amazing Grace and he sings it in a minor key, a deep, resonant, bassy minor key and completely like shifts the feel of the song. And it's profound. And, uh, and I, I encourage you to look it so up. You like it. So you like, you like Amazing Grace by Willie Nelson? Yeah. It's the only version I can stomach, but it's more than stomach okay. it. He took a song I loathed and turned it into something I, I want to listen. I oh. pay to listen to. <laughs> uh, just because he made it different, it caught your attention. So no, yeah, it's just... no, no. I didn't say that. It's I didn't. I didn't say it's mm -hmm. because it's different and caught my attention. I said I think mm -hmm. he did something profound with it. Singing mm -hmm. it in a minor key projects a completely different quality to those lyrics, uh, mm -hmm. and it's a different feeling. Like for instance, if I if I took a bubblegum music song, you know, just, uh, gosh, you know, uh, sugar, oh, honey, honey, you know, I just took something like that song, right? 
And I did it with distortion uh, and put it in a minor key and sang it slower. Mm. I would get mm. a different end product. And so I, you yeah, can do the yeah. same thing with the Star Spangled Banner. That's what Hendrix did on stage. It's not that mm. fascinating that he played with his teeth for 10 seconds. Uh, he did that mm. on other songs too. What's fascinating is that he changed the meaning of that song for a different era and time, for a protest mm. movement against the war, uh, for the meaning mm. of what Woodstock was. He changed the place of the Star Spangled Banner in the culture. And mm. to me, that's what Willie did with uh, mm. gospel songs okay. in many cases. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And they did it with their own tone. Their own tone, their own mm. choice of, you know, key and dimension. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So they didn't just that's reproduce. They gave new meaning to something. And I thought that was cool. But, you know, we, we talked a little bit about chasing the perfect tone. We uh, talked a little bit about copying someone's tone, about equipment obsession, how that can take over your life like a drug habit uh, and also take mm. over your bank account and leave you poor, uh, where you could just... Playing guitar is virtually free. <laughs> They're giving them away down at thrift stores, you know. But it's it's not that hard mm. to put together a, a guitar habit without a big budget uh, and sound pretty good. Like I say, Slash has actually gone into Guitar Center and bought $300 Squires and played them on stage, and they sound great. But mm. I, I have a question for you, Barry, because you're kind of the expert on this. Maybe we wind up the show with this. Sure, okay. When we talk about best. tone, we talk about tone. Yeah. Aside from this notion of the perfect tone, uh, which mm. is an endless slog that you'll never get there. It's like the perfect girlfriend or boyfriend. Like, quit looking because <laughs> they're not out there. You know, like, quit trading them in and finding you know, until you find the perfect one. You're going to get old. And if she's out there, she won't want you because <laughs> you're busy chasing some version that doesn't exist of her. But so, mm. so aside from that, though, what is tone? Yeah. When we talk about tone. Like, can you define it a little bit for us? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, um, I think, uh, okay, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an add on to the existing notes. That's the way I see it. So um, you got your high E string, for example, which is a thin in tone. It's thin in tone without any amplification or without anything. Take, a, take an acoustic guitar, a classical guitar, whatever. You take the, you take the high E string, all right? That's the first string. Um, that's that's got a, th a thin tone the thinnest type of tone on okay look i've got a, my, my guitar going through some some amps and all that you know digital amps but uh it will still stand okay so the high e string is a thin tone if you go to the fifth fret of the b string you can see it's the same pitch it's the same pitch but it's a little thicker in tone it's a thicker tone it's the same pitch, but it's a different tone. It's a different color to the sound. The ninth fret of G string, that's even thicker. The 14th fret of D string, it's the same note as the high E string. Listen to this. That's a thin tone, the same exact note. It's a thick tone. That's because of the physical string is thicker. It's actually changing the sound, you know? That's the A string, right, 19th fret, and then 24th fret. Listen to the 24th fret of low E string in comparison. It's almost chalk and cheese. You can hear there's a big difference. There's a sound, there's a tone difference. The pitch is exactly the same. So think of the guitar amps and the pedals and everything that goes on top of that same note. It's just going to change the, the, the character of that pitch but the, the pitch is the same. The tone is different. So Let me tell you I, why I asked the question, uh, just in the yeah, interest yeah. of time, because we're going to wind up in less than five minutes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, so sure. the, the reason I asked the question, and if you guys want more training on uh, building your tone and shaping your tone, that's precisely the kind of stuff you can get at guitarrealm.com. Barry's up for one-on-one -on -one lessons, or there's you can join and subscribe to the community and get a whole shitload of recorded lessons uh, if, if you're on a budget etc and don't want or don't have the time for one-on-one -on -one. you can't be at your uh, at your computer with your guitar or whatever um you're you know you're in your basement at three o'clock in the morning or something like that uh, although i've known barry to do lessons at three o'clock in the morning so don't rule it out if you're on a weird time zone barry 
specializes yeah. in accommodating weird oh, yeah. time zones. Yeah. I'm up till five in the morning sometimes. Yeah, and he's yeah. he's in South yeah. Africa, so you can align that up with a, with the United States really easily. I don't know what time it's yeah. there. Some ungodly hour right now. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's actually uh, look, it's a, it's a, a five fifty five p.m. exactly. Yeah, see, and it's oh, yeah. it's noon here right. almost. Yeah, <laughs> but the reason I ask that is because you know the guitar, the instrument comes with tone built in, and one could argue that the clean. Uh, when, when you turn off the distortion, you turn off every effect, that a, a good definition of tone is that it's synonymous with perfect tone. And I'm not trying to do a sophistry, but I'm saying the perfect tone is what you start with. It's not what you chase. You, you pick up the guitar and you play high E uh, or, mid, or middle C or whatever you want to play. You play a note perfectly clean with no other, without touching it with an effect. And that's the perfect tone of that instrument. Uh, and in the end, what you then do is you shape that tone to be imperfect. And that's why we add distortion. Rock and roll ca comes from introducing things that make the tone something other than perfect. And, and we get popular music out of precisely that versus, say, classical music, right? Where you sit down with a yeah. piano and everything is is uh pristine and pure it's the impurity mm -hmm. and that's why when we we hook up you know an effect or a, an amplifier that's not on the clean channel we call it adding dirt because we're mm -hmm. essentially it's the impurity or the imperfection that makes the kind of music that we make with an electric guitar with these instruments so i just wanted to to call mm -hmm. out that point because if you not I to like define it. tone theoretically but to say you already have the perfect tone in your hand there's nothing to go after that said, mm -hmm. I want to take a, a second, and Barry, I want to give you a second. We have three minutes maximum. Uh, I yeah. want to take a second and show you some of the stuff that I've chased. Uh, so yeah. this is, by some people, considered the perfect fuzz. It's very debatable. You know, Dunlop's per fuzz is the perfect fuzz. But this is made mm -hmm. by Analog Man. It's their, their Sun Lion fuzz. And i got to say that this is one of the acquisitions I got that I, I think is fantastic. Uh, but mm -hmm. along those lines, I got the Keeley fuzz. Totally different right? Mm -hmm. Creamy, deep, a little more compressed, not quite as, that's a germanium fuzz. This is a silicon mm -hmm. fuzz, a little bit different. There's no perfection, man. Uh, in the end, neither one of these is going to sound like Hendrix. But if I play a song by Hendrix or Eddie Hazel or something like that, on either one of these fuzzes, it'll sound different and unique and killer as hell, right? Yeah. And then the last pedal yeah. uh, I wanted to show today is called uh, Haunting Mids. And I love this thing. It's it's an EQ that mm -hmm. does one thing: boost your mid mid range. And mm -hmm. so it's like the simplest EQ in the world. So if you like that mid forward ACDC rock, you know this pedal just does something. It's subtle, but it's substantial and and kind of cool. And uh, and yet you know now I I can't mm -hmm. live without it hardly. So it's a matter of in my particular tonal desires. I got this thing turned mm -hmm. on all the time. You know. Uh, yeah. But I know that not a single guy whose songs I'm playing when I play a cover has is using this pedal. It's just me, and I don't give a crap that they're not using it. I'm shaping the tone in the way I think Angus's guitar could sound yeah. better. Well, it's it's, <laughs> it, it's kind of a almost a post production right there uh, while you're while you're doing it. Yeah, in the moment. Yeah, you know, so, because so the point post being... Post-production is going to bring in all those EQs that you just didn't quite nail exactly. at the time. So the point being, Angus sounds great, somebody, but chasing Angus's exact tone uh, for uh, Highway to Hell doesn't interest me nearly as much as what can I do to make that better sounding to me? And plug it in that pedal and mm -hmm. boosting the mids a little bit more gives me a sound that I... It's different, but I like it. What about you, nice. Barry? You've got something on your end, uh, an IR loader that you're in love uh, with. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm busy with an IR loader now. I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's, uh, if, you know, if, you, if you're battling with marking uh, cabinets um, uh, for streaming or uh, um, a recording at home, uh, it's great. An IR loader is just a, a modulation of your speaker cabinet. And um, yeah, I, I mean, just playing around with this one pedal, it, it's it's amazing what a, a mark setup and a different speaker size, different speaker cabinets can do to your tone over and above the amp and the pedals. So yeah. 
Give, give us a riff, man. Just a short one. A yeah, ten, yeah, well, a ten well, second okay, riff. Sure. I mean, this this is like a Mesa boogie going into a uh, a Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's. I mean, it sounds. I mean, this is all digital. It sounds. It sounds so. It sounds pretty close to an analog setup just for home studio use. So, I mean, that's my favorite thing at the moment. I'm really. I'm really into digital at the moment. It's. Uh, I've. I've loved it ever since you got that IR loader. Because I mean, they're basically. That's what an IR loader does. They're files built off of legit analog recordings of equipment that it would be too expensive for you to possess. Like if you want to own 35 really high-end vintage amps and 35 high-end vintage cabinets, and you've got that kind of cash, let alone space in your basement, sure, you could buy all of that. You're going to need a lot of cabling and switching around. It's going to be a part-time job. But you could also buy an IR loader and load those files in and get that cabinet sound to a certain degree. Somebody will say, well, it's not. A, there's a digital component. It's not truly analog. But in terms of what you can achieve on a reasonable budget with a reasonable amount of time, you press a button and you're playing, you know, an eight by eight Marshall stack on a on a 1962 Plexi. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. It's unreal. And there, I mean, I've just got, I've got like, this is an IR loader. It's an Omni IR cab loader. It's really not the top of the range, but it's, it's uh. great, man. So the yeah. point I'll make to finish up and then we got to end is that, you know, Barry's answer to chasing the perfect tone is why don't I just get a cafeteria of tones in a box, a menu and allow me to, to switch out and craft and sculpt my own combinations and things like that. So in a way, I like what you've done, Barry, much better than if somebody did spend ten thousand, twenty, thirty thousand dollars and build what they think is the ideal stack in their basement. In some ways, I think that costs you a couple hundred do quid or something like that. Oh, yeah. But yeah. you yeah, basically yeah. Uh, like you basically have the ability to switch that stack out instantaneously without leaving your your, your chair. <laughs> mm. Yeah, One, if I want a smashing pumpkin's tone, I don't have to go and uh, you know five hours later after hauling in an amp in the back. You know, uh, it's just a push of the button. If I want a if I want a jazzy type of, I can literally do a simulation and make my guitar sound hollow body. Yeah. You know, and you uh, can like play smashing pumpkins guitar. through that jazzy hollow body. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That'd be kind of fun. I would pay to hear that. Yes. And for more of those kind of videos, you got to search around YouTube to find Barry because yeah. he's been around. All right. With that, we got to end our show. Thanks. Uh, visit guitarrealm.com. And thanks for joining us with another episode of Guitar Wankers. Chisel. Oh.